GM, GM. Hello again, everyone. Hope you're doing well since we were with Austin a couple minutes ago. And welcome to those of you who are joining us now. I'm Sophia from Chainlink Labs. And with me, I have the one and only Patrick Hollis. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Patrick. We definitely appreciate it. Uh, Patrick will take us through a smart contract audit from start to finish. So definitely buckle up. And with that, the floor is all yours, Patrick. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. And let's get into it. We have a lot to cover today. So I'm going to switch over to my screen. And we're just going to jump right into it. Um, yeah, so we're going to be doing a live audit. We have one hour. Um, that's not a lot of time to do a lot of live audit. So we're going to be a little bit quick. I can see the chat. This is going to be an interactive workshop. I don't love static workshops. So I will be watching comments. Looking for feedback. How are you all doing today? Hope you're all doing fantastic. Let me know how you're doing in the chat because participation for this is required. So we're going to be learning about how to do a live audit, how to do security end to end. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Patrick Collins. I'm a smart country engineer, security researcher, educator. You can see some of the links to my socials there. QR codes are not great to scan. I need to take that off of my presentation here. Uh, but you can find us at cypher.io. You can go to codehawks.com. Um, and uh, I'll be sharing some other resources where you can contact and connect with us as well. So here's the agenda for what we're going to be going over. So we're going to do a quick welcome, go over some resources, really quickly go over the audit process, and then we're going to do a live audit. And guess what? We are going to, oh, let me hide myself. We are going to, let me hide all these. Doop, doop. Uh, we are going to be doing a live audit that you get to pick. We'll be picking out of these three. Uh, ranging from easiest to hardest in terms of difficulty, we'll come back where you all will choose which one we want to do a live audit of, uh, which is going to make this presentation very dynamic, also kind of nuts. So, um, but before we do that, a couple quick shout outs. Definitely go sign up for CodeHawks. If anyone is looking to level up their game as either a security researcher or to become an advanced Solidity security, excuse me, an advanced Solidity developer, CodeHawks, absolutely the place to go test your skills, try your skills. Uh, we have First Flights, which recently launched, which are beginner-friendly security and auditing reviews. Definitely be sure to subscribe to my YouTube because we have an insane security course coming out this month, and it will be on the site updraft.siphon.io, which is going to be our new education platform, which we are crazy excited to launch. So uh, be sure to hit all of that up after this. So with that all being said, what is a smart contract audit or security review? A quick primer. What are we even doing in this presentation? Well, a smart contract audit or security review is a time boxed security review. That's pretty much it. It's not a guarantee code is bug free. It's not a promise that there will be no hacks. It is a time boxed security review. Yes, you want to find bugs. Yes, you want to improve the security of the protocol. But that's what it is. You have a certain window of time to squash as many bugs as possible and to give the protocol that you're working with as much information as possible as how they can stay secure. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing a security review and it'll be the speedy, super fast version of it. Now there's typically two trains of thoughts on two different types of smart contract reviews or, or audits or, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the typical two different types are going to be competitive or a, Oh, excuse me, let me hide myself. Competitive or a private audit. In competitive, the focus is purely on finding as many high impact bugs as possible because that's how you get paid out. That's how you get scored. Whereas a private audit is that first part. Part You want to find as many high impact bugs as possible. And then additionally, you want to do whatever you can to make the client safer. This might be improving their test suite, improving their engineering practices, improving whatever. The private audit is much more consultative, whereas the competitive is much more, hey, let's just hammer out as many bugs as possible. Uh, for this presentation, we are going to be going through the audit process, kind of a quick high level of it. There is a phenomenal video on my YouTube uh, called How to Audit ENS, or Top Web3 Security Researcher gives you his exact audit process. This is with legendary security researcher Tincho. He was previously the lead security uh, researcher at Open Zeppelin. He is now working at uh, this place called the Red Guild, where they just do a lot of badass security stuff. Um, but we go through the whole process in that video if you want to learn more. But at the end of the day, the process is essentially what you see on the screen here. Get as much context as possible, go through the tools that you have and do manual review of the code base, and then write the report. 
Here's kind of the more in-depth look at what that process looks like. Uh, it's going to be broken down into three phases. We have an initial review where you do scoping, which is like getting a good idea of how big the code base is, what which contracts exactly you should be auditing, et cetera. Then you go into recon where you're going through the code base, you're going through the docs, you're learning about what the code base should do. Then you finally you know, start identifying uh, vulnerabilities. And then at the end, you report everything. That's the real basic main process. After you do that and you deliver a report, the protocol will fix the issues. And then you'll basically repeat step one to make sure they actually fixed all the stuff that uh, you asked them to do. And the more you do this, the better you get. So do this a whole lot. That's how you become a pro is you just do this a lot and you consistently say, how do I get better? How do I get better? How do I get better? Which is the main re rationale for why CodeHawks is such a valuable tool because you can consistently train and see where you messed up, which is the most important thing. In private audits, it can be very difficult for you to get feedback on how well you did. So for tools for this um, live audit, we're gonna be using Foundry. Static analysis for Solid, or excuse me, Slither, and we're going to be doing uh, Solid a little bit as well. And at Darren, we're not going to be going over fuzzing for verification, symbolic execution. But if you're interested in those things, be sure to watch the course that we uh, uh, are going to come out with very soon. So, with that being said, I know I blasted through that. Um, let's see the comments. Which one of these do we want to do? Now, let me give you a quick rundown. Which one of these do you want to see a live audit of? We will have 50 minutes to go through. One of these, we are not going to find all the bugs because each one of these, uh, I've specifically planted a ton of bugs in each one of them. Um, let me, let's me let start seeing in the comments what we want to see. But let me give you the, the rundown of each one. So the puppy raffle is the easiest one. And I highly recommend we go over that one just because getting context is one of the hardest parts of the audit, right? And getting context on a raffle is really easy. Uh, this was also recently completed on CodeHawk's first flight. It's a raffle. It's lottery-based. Really easy. But there are some really intense, really interesting bugs inside of it. Uh, next, there's Thunder Loans. This is a little bit harder. This actually just completed um, on first flight on CodeHawk's. It is in judging right now. So the report hasn't been released. This one's a little bit harder because this is DeFi-based. We're talking borrowing and lending. Um, there's a lot more money involved. And then finally, we have Boss Bridge. This one's the hardest. This one is currently live on CodeHawks. So if we do this one, I will literally be giving you uh, alpha. I will literally be giving you reports. Uh, I don't really want to do that. This one's definitely the hardest because some of the bugs and some of the issues on this one involve signatures, involving cross-chain, involving all this different stuff. And this is a cross-chain bridge-based protocol. So getting context, getting up to speed is actually going to be a lot more difficult. So uh, now that you have some context, Final, you have 60 seconds to to put your vote in the chat. Let me scroll up. Let's see what people what people voted for. Okay, bridge, loan, 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 puppy, loan, loan, bridge, loan, uh, loan, loan. All of them, you, Tony, <laughs> uh, loan, bridge. Uh, is it possible to have a fast dap? Yes, it is. Loan, puppy, puppy, loan, puppy, loan, uh, loan. Puppy, loan, puppy. Okay, bridge, puppy. Okay, it seems like Thunder Loan is going to be the winner here. Uh, unless unless any any final uh, any final votes. Okay, cool. So Loan is great. Loan is great because Loan is uh, still relatively difficult. So like I said, this one just completed on CodeHawks. So we can actually go to 2023, uh, 10 Thunder Loan. Um, uh, com slash cyphran slash 23 11 no 10 under loan under loans well we're gonna find out in just a second Surprise. under loan aha uh -huh. 11th under low. Okay. So this is the code base we're going to be working with. If you want to follow along, you can go ahead and get clone this. I'm going to get clone this. It is Cypherin slash 2023 11 Thunder Loan. And again, if you go to CodeHawks, if you're interested in seeing the final results of this, go to CodeHawks, first flights, scroll down, go to the first flight number three, Thunder Loan. Um, this pretty soon will have the final report up here and you can read about it uh, and see like the actual 
you know, uh, what, what people actually found. But let's go ahead. Clone this. Let's get to work. Get clone. Paste it in. CD2023. Open this up in its own little own little folder here. All right, nice. We are in here. We are in Thunderlone. Congrats. We've chosen Thunderlone as our, oh, thank you, Darb, um, as our protocol of choice. This is what we're going to be a, doing a security review on. So what is the first step that we should do? Well, if we go back to our slides here, go back to the process. Oop, I passed it, didn't I? What is the first step? Well, we're going to be in phase one. We're going to do the initial review. The first thing is scoping. What is scoping? Well, it's us figuring out what we're even doing. What are we even doing? So this is where, you know, we'll go to the readme, we go to the protocol and we go, hey, what do you want us to audit? What do you want us to do a security review on? How big is this code base? What's going on? So uh, in this, the, uh, the scope has already been laid out for us. So we have some contest details. Let me zoom out just a hair. We have some contest details. We have some docs that we're going to read. Let me scroll down. Um, but if we scroll all the way down here, we have this audit scope details. So we have a commit hash here. We have some the files that are going to be in scope. We've got some notes on compatibilities. We've got some roles, et cetera. This is the main part of our scoping. So this is the, the commit hash is obviously really important because we want to be working with the exact code that they're going to be deploying to production. And the files are obviously really important because if we start auditing some random file that they didn't ask for, well, we're not going to get paid on that. And we, we want to get paid on it. We want to make sure um, their code base that we're working with is secure. So somebody asked, can a beginner be a part of this? The answer is yes. Um, just follow along with me best you can. So it's going to be very, there's, it's going to be very fast. If this is confusing, uh, don't worry. I would say go um, watch the security and auditing course when that comes out. So uh, beginners, yes, you can take part in this. It will be a little bit difficult. I will say that straight up. So uh, so we can go back to the code base. Let's go into the S. So this is a Foundry project. So you do have to be a little bit familiar with Foundry here. Uh, if you're familiar with Hardhat or Brownie, uh, this would be right here is where you go, okay, I'm going to go you know, learn Foundry real quick. And maybe you go, okay, you know, Foundry. And you look up Foundry and you try to do some stuff in Foundry because this is clearly a Foundry project. Uh, we even have in the top of this full uh, file, we have some getting started. You need Git. Okay, we have Git. You need Foundry. Okay, I have Foundry. All right, I can run. Oh. Zoom in just there. I can run Forge build. Um, and it's going to actually install everything, build everything. It actually tells me to, to run make. Um, make uh, is defined in the make file. Make The make file is also just going to run forge build. So like whatever. Um, but we're still kind of in this scoping phase. We're like, what are we even doing, right? One of the things that I always do for any audit or security review is I use this tool called Solidity Metrics. So in VS Code extensions, you can look up Solidity Metrics, this tool right here. It's by Tintin Web uh, Consensus Diligence. And what it does once you install it is you can right click your folder with all the files. You can hit Solidity Metrics and you'll get a wonderful little output that looks like this. And if you scroll down, it gives you a lot of really helpful um, lines here such as, okay, how many lines of code is this whole project? Okay, it's 387 lines of code. It's got a complexity score of 325. Oh, uh, my camera's in the way, let me, complexity score of 325. These numbers won't mean anything to you until you audit or do enough security reviews. The more security reviews you do, the more you'll learn, ah, okay, it's 300, 400 lines of code, that'll take me a week, or that'll take me two days, or that'll take me two weeks. Getting familiar with how quickly you can audit, how familiar you are with concept is really important, especially for this phase. And if you're pricing, uh, if you're doing a private audit, this will be how you can price your services. If you're doing a competitive audit, this will be how you can judge you know, how, how quickly, um, how much time to allot to certain spots, et cetera. So this is still all part of this scoping phase. 
Um, there's more in here as well. You can read more about kind of like comment to source ratio, um, different types of functions. There's a lot of just goodies in here. So we checked out how much time do I have left? Okay, 45 minutes. Nice. We're making pretty good time. So we've checked out the the scope. We've looked at the contracts we need to uh, um, to work with. We've also got this compatibilities bit down here. This is really important. If a protocol doesn't give this to you, you should ask for this. What chains are you deploying to? What tokens are you working with? What Solidity version are you working with? Uh, and this is all really important because there are a lot of bugs that you can find with um, weird tokens or weird chains or weird versions, et cetera. So it, it's not going to really matter for this one so much. Okay, that's not true. There are some weird token um, things in this one. Uh, but it is good to scope all this information out so that when you go into this protocol, you can know, okay, here are the external sources that I can attack this protocol with. So uh, Sulk version for this one, though, pretty standard, 0 0.8.20. Uh, chains ETH, pretty easy. Um, there are some weird ERC-20s in here, but we're not going to go into that uh, yet. So uh, we've done some scoping. We've worked with the protocol. We understand what we're supposed to be doing. These are the contracts we're supposed to be doing. If we don't know, this is where you would go to the protocol and you would ask them, hey, what the hell am I doing? If you're doing a competitive audit, you can jump into the Discord of the competitive audit, say, what the hell am I doing? And ask questions. Right away, I want to tell you, it, a, a real good security review or audit has constant communication between you and the protocol or you and the other competitive auditors. Why? Because they are always going to have more context for this code base than you ever will. Why? Right? Well, because they wrote the damn thing, right? They wrote the damn code. So they know every inch of it. They understand it a lot better than you ever will. So asking questions is good during a competitive audit or a private audit. If there's anything you don't understand, ask tons of questions. I'm going to pause right now because we're pretty much done with the scoping. Any questions so far? And yes, I'm going to be giving you all a little sneak peek to the uh, to the Thunder Loan report that's going to come out pretty soon. Any questions so far? No questions. Y'all just want to jump in. All right, great. Excellent. All right, cool. So we're done with the scoping. We know what we're supposed to be doing. Next is Recon. Okay, what the heck is Recon? Well, let me show you something really cool. Um, uh, demystifying, here's it is. Uh, demystifying exploitable bugs in smart contracts. This is a really cool paper a research study that a bunch of researchers did and you can find their paper here and if you scroll down in here let's look at this this here image let's scroll a little bit more this is what their study came up with this graphic over here on the left in the real world around 20 percent of bugs were what's called machine auditable meaning some tool could have or should have caught the bug. That is a lot of bugs, 20% of all real-world exploits. 80% of bugs were machine unauditable, meaning it would have been very difficult or borderline impossible for a modern-day tool to catch the bug. What does this mean? It means a couple of things. It means, number one, manual review is a really powerful tool to catch a lot of bugs. And number two we should 100% be running tools because we're going to catch at least 20% of bugs just running tools. And then number three, and probably most important, this gives us some indication that, hey, maybe a lot of bugs out there have nothing to do with being a Solidity savant and have something to do with understanding business logic. And that is 100% the case. Most bugs out there, and I'm zooming on me on this, how do I, most bugs, most bugs that you will find and most bugs that exist are not the result of some crazy assembly solidity compiler nonsense. Most bugs are a result of a poor or improper business logic implementation. 
So with that knowledge, what does that mean? That means that if you're going to do a security review on a protocol, you better understand what the protocol is supposed to do. If you do not understand what the protocol is supposed to do, you will be unable to audit it. Full stop. Most bugs come from business logic implementation. So with that being said, what is the first thing that we should do in this recon phase? Well, the first thing we should do is read the documentation. That is always 100% going to be your first step. So that's what we're going to do. And we're going to kind of do it quickly because uh, we only have 40 minutes left here. <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, we're going to kind of do this a little bit quickly. So this is where beginners might start have, uh, having a little bit of a harder time because this is kind of an advanced DeFi protocol. But the process you can still follow along with uh, because the process is going to be the same no matter what, right? So if you don't fully understand what the hell I'm talking about here, when I'm talking about like the DeFi borrow and lending, that's fine. Just focus on the process that I'm taking. Okay, cool. A uh, couple questions. Being audited implies that you're being audited against some compliance rules regs. What are you being audited against? So great question. Um, this is why the term audited is actually a terrible term. And we should say it's a security review because that's what it is. It's a security review. Auditing, uh, smart contract audit is kind of a misnomer. How did you find papers like this? You just you're in the security space. You have a lot of security stuff coming in. Oh, this is cool. A flash loan protocol. Yes. Okay. So we're going to read the docs very quickly, get a rough understanding. If you're like Patrick, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. That's fine. Focus on the process that we focus on. Great. So here's what this protocol does. This is called the Thunder Loan Protocol and is meant to do the following. Two things. Give users a way to create flash loans and give liquidity providers a way to earn money off of their capital. Right away, this gives us a lot of really good information. And if we scroll up to the top, we see this is a flash loan protocol based off of Aave and Compound. Right away, we know if we're familiar with Aave and Compound, that's going to be knowledge that will translate over to this audit. Oftentimes, right here, right in the product, right in the right recon phase, we might say, okay, let me go understand those code bases. And there's a lot of DeFi staples like Aave, Compound, Uniswap that you should be familiar with. Uh, you should be familiar with because they are DeFi primitives and a lot of protocols will be based off of them. So if you understand how they work, it's much easier to ramp up quickly on protocols like this one. So Thunderloan based off of Aave and Compound. If you know how Aave and Compound work, if you're familiar with some of the bugs or the issues that they might have, you can apply that to here. This goes back to repetition is the mother skill. The more you do this, the better you will get. So it's based off of Aave and Compound. We're going to create flash loans, give liquidity providers a way to earn their capital. So flash loans, I don't have time to really explain flash loans. Um, so, okay, so beginners, you might have a hard time here. Again, focus on the process. Real quick summary of flash loans. Flash loans are a way to take out a loan, do something with the money, and then return all the money in one transaction, right? So it's like, like a super, super, super fast loan that exist for exactly one transaction, right? Why do people want to do this? Well, uh, there's a, a lot of good reasons why. Uh, one of the biggest uh, uses for it is to do arbitrage. It allows people who are not whales to be whales for a second. I actually love it as a financial tool because it allows anyone to be a whale for one transaction. Uh, it's a really cool financial primitive in, that's only available in DeFi, which is really freaking cool. So uh, you can take out a loan, do some crazy stuff with it. Take it. You can take out like a $10 million loan uh, in one transaction so long as you immediately pay it back, right? Uh, crazy. So maybe you take out the $10 million loan. You go use it to invest in something for one transaction. You make $5. You send it back. Cool, you made $5. Huzzah. So that's what this protocol wants to do. Uh, and then give liquidity providers a way to earn money off the capital. In order to take out a million dollar loan, someone needs to be lending out a million dollars. So liquidity liquidity providers are just lenders. They're people going, hey, hey, I got a million dollars here. Anyone want to take out a flash loan? And the reason that they do that is because they charge a very small fee for someone, you know, so let's say I'm a, I'm a liquidity provider. I have a million dollars. I go, yeah, here, you can have it for a quick second and then just give me a dollar. You can have it for a quick second and then give me $2. So um, that's kind of the high level of flash loans. I know that's not nearly enough information, but uh, this would be all part of the, uh, recon process, right? You'd be going, what is a flash loan? I need to understand flash loans. I need I need to do diagrams. A lot of times the Cypher team, we will do diagrams. We will 
literally spend a day and a half building diagrams of a system or working with a protocol to get diagrams up, right? You want to understand this protocol end to end from a high level. So it allows people to do flash loans. Great. Liquidity providers can deposit assets into Thunderloan and be given asset tokens in return. So, okay, so we're going to deposit something like ETH and we're going to get like a receipt that says, hey, you've deposited money into this protocol. These receipts are called asset tokens. These asset tokens gain interest over time, depending on how many people take out flash loans. So you deposit your money into Thunder Loans, and the money that you deposited is going to earn interest. It's going to earn fees based, you know, the more people take out flash loans, the more fees you're going to accrue. And the asset tokens are that receipt that keeps track of that. Again, if this is confusing, don't worry, just focus on the process. We're in the recon phase. We're learning about the protocol. What is a flash loan? I talked about this already. Uh, users additionally have to pay a small fee to the protocol, depending on how much money they borrow. Great. And then finally, we are planning to upgrade the current Thunderloan contract to the Thunderloan upgraded contract. Please include this upgrade in scope of a security review. So additionally, it looks like this is going to be an upgradable smart contract. Right away, you're going, cool. What do I know about upgradable smart contracts? Okay, I know about the diamond standard, UUPS, transparent proxy. This all goes back to this reservoir of knowledge that you need to have. The more you do this, the more that reservoir will build. And if I'm talking gibberish to you right now, like I said, that's fine. That's okay. It'll get better. So, uh, and one question, can I rewatch this stream later? Yes, you absolutely can. So, so now we're, we're still in kind of this uh, recon phase. Maybe also we start kind of, you know, running, you know, forge test. Let's see if test pass, uh, we start, um, Maybe we start kind of reading the protocol a little bit. But again, we're just building context for, hey, what should this protocol do, right? And you can kind of, you know, we're starting to kind of slide now into the uh, vulnerability identification phase, but it's fine. It's kind of a gradual slide to that to the next phase here. But for all intents and purposes, let's say we're done with recon. It's time to jump in. It's time to jump into the protocol. It's time to actually start looking at some code. There are tons of ways to actually start looking at some code. One of the ways that's most popular is something that I like to call the tin show. So if we go back to Solidity Metrics, what we can do is we can grab this list here. We can copy paste this into like a Google Sheets and just start going through the code base by smallest to largest, um, to largest uh, file. So the smallest files here, are going to be these interfaces so maybe we start looking at these interfaces just to get some quick wins under our belt uh, that's one of the ways we can start and that's one of the ways we will start additionally we probably want to run some tools on this so there's a whole bunch of tools that um that you want to run pretty much on any audit or any um or any security review and those are going to be slither and a darren those are the tools you should run on every single code base if it's Solidity, no matter what, full stop. Uh, Slither, I already have it installed. It's a static analysis tool. A Darren is also another static analysis tool. So to run Slither, we just do Slither dots. Um, in this project, I have a little Slither in the make file. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to run make Slither, which has some... Um, Oops, I actually don't want the checklist. It has some uh, parameters that I've given to it. Um, but what this is going to do, it's going to give you a whole lot of stuff to like look for issues. And right away, we can see some, hey, you're missing an event. You know, this spot should emit an event. Boom. And already, we have found some informational findings. Huzzah, look at this. You're already becoming a security researcher. Great job. Um, most of the time, this is like the bare minimum though, right? So run Slither, it'll give you an output like that. The next tool is a Darren. Uh, I already have both of these installed. I'm not going to show you how to install these right now, but, um, these should both absolutely be run. Uh, a Darren is a bird. And instead of printing out to the terminal, it creates this report.md, which looks like this. It's kind of this markdown report. If I preview it. It'll give me this static analysis report. Uh, it has a whole bunch of findings in here already. Hey, there's a centralization risk. 
There's a, you're calling something that might be dangerous. You're missing some zero address checks. Uh, already we're starting to, to find issues, which is great, right? Um, cool. And then we'd look at those for, uh, you know, and create some notes. So, but, so once we run our tools, now we can actually start jumping to the code base. So, like I said, if you want to do the Tincho report, uh, Tincho way, great, where we start with the smallest uh, code bases and start looking into it, we can absolutely do that. Maybe we look at this iFlash one receiver, it's an interface, it's really small. Um, for, uh, for the purposes of this demo, I'm just going to jump into what I like to call um, one of the, the, what is the main function? Like, how does this protocol start? How does this thing start up, right? So what I might do is I might go like bounce around in the scripts or the test and say, okay, how does this, how does this project even work? Right? So I look at the de their deploy scripts. Okay. It looks like they're going to deploy the contract and they're going to put a proxy around it. So it looks like, so this is an ERC 1967 proxy. This is how it's an upgradable contract. Okay, cool. That doesn't really give me that much context. Maybe let's look at the tests. Okay. Let's go to the unit tests. They have this base test. Okay, this is telling me a much different story, right? In this base test, this setup function is telling me how they want to set up the protocol, right? So it looks like they're launching their Thunder loan, and then they're launching this weird mock pool factory. They're launching two tokens. They're doing this weird create pool. Um, they're doing the proxy thing, and then they're deploying the Thunder loan and initializing it with a mock pool factory so what is this mock pool factory maybe i'll start looking into this uh there's not a whole lot of docs in here so that's not super helpful um but uh, i'm going to tell you right now looking into this pool factory more you'll find calls create pool it creates this mock t swap pool which is this super small code base and all it has is this get price of one pool token in weth so it looks like this right away, um, they're using some type of uh, DEX or some type of AMM to get the price of an asset. Yeah, somebody said Uniswap factory. Yep, so this T-swap pool is kind of a, uh, is looking like a Uniswap factory clone uh, and that's what they're doing here. So uh, I'm getting some, I'm just getting context, right? Like what is this doing? And as I'm looking through this code base, maybe I have like a little file, .notes.md, oops. Is it dot notes dot md where I'm saying what is mock t swap pool? Uh, is that an AMM? Just some place that I can like dump raw notes and thoughts, right? I'm just dumping notes, I'm just dumping thoughts. And then oftentimes, what a lot of people will do is they'll put questions right into the code base, myself included. You know, if I see this, I might go question a queue for like question. What is mock pool factory? And asking these questions consistently is really the secrets. One of the, you know, again, there's no silver bullet for auditing or security view, but these cues is really kind of the secret sauce, right? You want to just keep asking questions. Hey, what does this do? What does this do? What does this do? How does this work? You want to, at the end of this, be a pro and really understand every aspect of this code base. What does this do? What does that do? So we want to be asking a lot of questions. So for me, uh, instead of going through the tests, what I might do is I like to say, okay, well, what's the what's the main function? Where do we start? And again, you can start wherever you want. Um, to me, this goes back to the readme. Okay, well, how does this protocol actually work? Uh, how does this protocol actually work? Okay, liquidity providers can deposit assets into Thunderloan and be given asset tokens in return. These asset tokens gain interest over time, depending on how many people take out flash loans. Okay, so cool. So I want to see, okay, where do I deposit stuff? And then how do I take out a flash loan, right? Those are probably two functions that need to exist for this protocol to like do anything. So that's my, where uh, that's probably where I might want to start. So I'm going to look into here. So we have this asset token contract. This is probably that token that it gives us. We have this Oracle upgradable. What the hell is this? We'll probably learn about this later. And then we have this Thunder Loan thing, and this looks like this is going to be the main contract, right? There's a whole bunch of code in here. Uh, but if we look, function, deposit, aha. So we have this deposit function. It doesn't have any NAT specs. When I say Q, is this where liquidity providers 
deposit funds to be lent out. Maybe I ask a question, go through this function, try to figure that out. Now I'm also probably gonna look for flash loan. Mm, aha, flash loan function down here. Q, how does this work? And maybe I start, just pick one and I start going uh, into it. So uh, give me one second. I wanna see which, which one of the highs I want to write up for this. Mm. All these highs are kind of confusing. All right, let's go into the flash loan. So this flat, this giant flash loan function looks like it's one of the most important functions in the code base. So I'm going to walk through it and try to understand what it actually does. So we have this function flash loan. It looks like it has a, it takes in a receiver address token, uh, am I toggle, what wrap? Okay, receiver address, token amount and params. So I might even just ask what, Q, excuse me, what are these params? So, I might start asking questions, hey, like what do these do, right? And I might come back to these questions later and answer them. So it looks like the first thing we're doing is this asset token equals S token to asset token token. So what the heck? So I'm, I'm assuming maybe like I'll do like a Q E like, or E for explain that we borrow token, we borrow amount of token. So we're going to borrow some amount of some token and send the token to receiver address with data rams so i'm assuming this is what it does you know maybe i go through codebase and try to verify this so this protocol has some token um that we're going to send to somebody so we go okay cool so asset token uh, s token to asset token we can see what this mapping is it looks like mm, does this work Looks like there's this function called set allowed token. So some owner of the protocol says, okay, these are the these are the tokens that this protocol supports, maybe like DAI, maybe like USDC, etc. And this again, this I would do like a little E. Let me see the asset token represents a receipt that I deposited funds. E. Um, also where the tokens are stored it looks like all asset token to get this asset token and then we say starting balance equals erc20 token dot balance of the asset token so this is where it gets really confusing so the tokens are stored in the asset token which is like what what the heck are we talking about here? We'd say the token we want to borrow deposited by the liquidity provider is stored in the asset token contract. And I will literally write out like explanations to myself. Uh, the reason that I know this is because I've kind of been up and down the code base. But um, if you didn't know this, you would ask like a question. What, why is the tokens or why are the tokens being stored on the assets token contract that is up with that it looks like we're getting the starting balance and this makes sense because a flash loan flash loan says i will borrow tokens so long as i pay them all back so we're getting this starting balance of the asset token. And there's probably gonna be a check at the end for the ending balance, there sure is. We're saying, hey, the ending balance needs to, if, if the ending balance is less than the starting balance plus some fee, then this whole thing will revert. And that's great. So this is kind of the check here that says if the flash loan can even happen. If the person doesn't repay, the whole thing will revert and whatever they did will revert. Um, so it will be no good. So great. So we have the starting balance. Uh, we're doing this stuff here. Now we just have some checks here. If the amount that they want to borrow 
is greater than the starting balance. Well, obviously that won't work, so we revert. Okay, that makes sense. The receiver address needs to be a contract. I'm not going to go over that right now. Looks like they have this fee bit where we can get a fee. Okay, cool. Uh, I might ask, you know, how does this fee work? And I'm going kind of quick because I only have 20 minutes left. Uh, I might see all these weird slithers and I might go, why do we have these slithers? I might ask, what is this exchange rate? Um, yes, in these security reviews, you're going to ask a ton of questions. Okay, we emit a flash loan. Okay, we have this weird mapping that says currently flash loaning, which is set to true. Uh, okay, this line, this asset token dot transfer underline to line is where the uh, um, user gets the tokens, right? So we have asset token dot transfer underline to receiver address amount. So this is where we actually do the borrowing, right? So we have all this all this code to like set it up. And this is the line that actually sends money. So we have like, you know, user sent the, the money, right? So this is where the user sent the money. And then at some point before this part gets called, money has to be sent back from the user, right? So user gets sent the money. Then we have this, receive address that function call. And so this is going to be the, um, uh, so we're, we're sending the money to the user. And then we're also in the flash loan contract, we're saying, oh, by the way, like execute whatever you want to do. So we're doing receiver address dot function call, whatever you want to do, whatever parameters you put in, just, just go ahead, go crazy. Just make sure you pay us back at the end. Right. And then we have this little check that says, Hey, um, let's make sure you actually sent the money back. And if not, we return false. Now, right away, uh, I know we went over a lot here, but right away, this is, we should ask, uh, this check here should set some alarm bells off. What, what is going on? So all we do is we check the starting balance and then we check the ending balance. So we say, okay. So long as the ending balance is greater than the starting balance, we're good, right? They returned the money, right? Well, is there a way for me to return the money in a way that I can pull the money back out later? Well, if we scroll up, uh, excuse me, if we scroll down, we have this repay function that it looks like this is what is intended to be called. So like, um, basically we would go like flash loan, which would then call some user function. And then that user function would call repay and then flash loan checks money is still there. But is there another way we could break this? Let's go back up to that deposit function. Looks like this is a way to send money to the protocol and then I can actually redeem or withdraw money later. What if I do flash loan, call the user function, instead of repay, I call deposit. So let's say, start with like 100 USDC. We flash loan it to user. User calls some function. They call deposit, which sends the 100 USDC back to the protocol. So now there's 100 USDC back in the protocol. Flash loan checks. It goes, yep, there's enough money in here. And we then redeem slash withdraw the tokens. And it's questions like this where we go, oh, we should check that out. Is there a way for this to break the protocol. And I'm going to tell you right now, just because we only have 15 minutes left, uh, the answer is yes. Um, this is this is one of the bugs with this protocol. And this is where I would write like a proof of code to say, hey, is is this real? Like, can I can I actually write a test case where this is an issue? So I would go to their test suite, go to units, you know, I would go to like Thunderloan, whatever, and I would start fiddling with it. Maybe I go like function test can break 
slash loan public. And I want to prove that this happens. Why? Why is it so important for you to prove this happens? Well, a whole bunch of reasons. In a competitive audit, if you do some crazy, wild, nonsense finding, judges are going to invalidate it unless you prove it. Additionally, in a competitive audit, uh, you want to be the selected report because you get more money because of that. You want to make sure your report is as good as possible. If you don't do a proof of code, you're not going to get the selected report. But more importantly, it is your job as a security researcher to convince, to prove to the protocol, hey, this is an issue and this needs to be fixed. And if you do not prove that it is an issue, guess what? They're not going to fix it and it's going to be your fault. So you want to do your best you can to prove there's an actual, there's an actual issue here. So we'd write a proof of code. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to write the proof of code, but we would. Uh, and then we would use that in our write-up. And then finally, we would do a write-up. Let's say we, we've done the proof of code. We go, oh my God, you can actually uh, steal all the funds in the protocol because you do a flash loan and then you deposit it instead of actually you know pulling it out. Um, this is where you do your actual findings. You do your report. So maybe I'll do like a findings.md. Uh, and you would write the first finding. So I've got a little cheat sheet. Um, this is my finding layout for writing a phenomenal finding. Uh, here's the, the layout you should use. This is going to be in the security course coming up, by the way. The title of your finding should be the root cause to the impact. So for this one, for this finding here, um, the root cause is that flash loan users can uh, can call deposit instead of repay to steal flash loan funds. So root cause is flash loan users can call deposit instead of repay. And then the impact is to steal flash loan funds. Root cause, impact. That's how you write a phenomenal title. And then you pick a severity. We're going to say this is H1. You pick a severity where well, you look at the impact. And you look at the likelihood. You do kind of the average of the two. So uh, what is the impact of this? Okay, we can steal funds. Okay, stealing funds is bad. That's a high issue. <laughs> likelihood, how easy is this to do? This would be, we would have to go back to the code base, look at how easy this is to do. Uh, I'm going to say right now, the likelihood of this is high. It's very easy to do. It's very easy in this protocol to steal all the funds. Doing that, so we'd say it's a high. Then we'd write a little description for it. Uh, we would say something like um, a very succinct description where we'd say, uh, I didn't write this one out yet. Uh, calling Thunder Loan deposit uh, while doing a flash loan passes the balance check at the end of Thunder Loan flash loan, but allows the attacker to withdraw the funds out of it after. So uh, do like a, a succinct description, uh, talk about the rest of how it works, more, more details about the attack, et cetera. The impact, this should be pretty quick as well. We say it allows attackers to drain the funds of the protocol by um, uh, calling a flash loan, positing it instead of repaying it, and then redeeming funds directly after. Proof of concept, this is where we would write you know, our script. Code here. That's where we'd write our code here. Or we would say, like, here are the steps. One, uh, user calls flash loan. Two, 
blah, 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 whatever. Sorry, I'm going kind of quick. And then recommend a mitigation. How do we prevent this from happening? Uh, we could say add a check to not allow people to deposit if they are in the middle of a flash loan. And maybe we'll do like a little diff. We say, hey, add this line or subtract this line, et cetera. If we preview that, this is kind of what this looks like. I know I'm kind of going crazy fast because I thought I was going to be quicker with this, but I clearly wasn't. Um, and so you'll do, you'll put a string enough of these findings together, uh, including informationals, highs, lows, any type of severity, and you will give that to the client or you will submit each one of these individually to a competitive audit. And that's vulnerability identification and reporting. And that's really the end of phase one. So I know we were super quick through that. Um, probably too quick, to be honest. But hopefully you guys learned a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, for uh, it's really difficult to kind of do a live audit in just an hour um, because you see how long it takes just to get context, right? How long it takes to get up to speed. You guys all were like, hey, let's do the, the harder one. Let's do the, the, the DeFi one where you have to explain the flash loans and stuff. The biggest part of this is how does the business logic work? Does the code base match the what it's supposed to do? And in this case, it didn't, right? And I, I didn't really explain the bug very well because we didn't have a lot of time. Um, but the issue was, hey, if you take out a flash loan, instead of repaying it, you can deposit it in the protocol. The protocol thinks you repaid it, and then you just redeem it and steal it out later. And that's not good. That's not what the protocol intended. That's an issue. We write it up, we report it, send it to the protocol. Uh, we will be doing this exact code base in the upcoming security course, uh, where we will be much more in depth, we will be much less fast, and we will show you exactly the issues uh, in minimized examples as well. So also in the ciphering code base, um, we have this uh, resource, SC, SC, uh, SC Exploits Minimized, which stands for Smart Contract Exploits Minimized, where if you scroll down here, we go into SRC. We've got a ton of um, exploits in these different folders. Uh, we've got test cases, which show you exactly how, they, how we break them, what we do to them. We scroll down. Not only that, we have links to Remix. Or if you want to see like what one of these looks like in Remix, you want to fiddle with it in Remix, you can just click the, the button, which will bring you over to, to Remix, pop you um, pop you into right to the code base. So this is an example of like a re-entrancy vulnerable contract if you want to play with it right in Remix. Uh, and then additionally, we have uh, Ethernaut challenges for you to learn more uh, about that specific attack in kind of like a capture the flag sense damn vulnerable DeFi as well, and then case studies. Where has this hack actually happened in real life? And we've got a ton of these. So if you want to learn more of these exploits in kind of a, a hands-on way, uh, you, you should go here. Uh, these, uh, we're gonna go over all of these in the upcoming security course as well. So uh, yes, Cypher and Updraft, that's where you can go learn more. But with that being said, thank you all for coming. Uh, have a couple more minutes for questions. If anyone has any questions, I know we were super quick here, but does anyone have any questions? And hope you all learned a lot. Let me know if you didn't learn a lot. I forgot my my feedback QR code. How do you stay motivated during these audits? I struggled last time I tried for the audit that just ended. I love this question. Amazing question. How do you stay motivated? These are time intensive. It, um, you can't just sit, most of these, like even like a 300 co line code base, you can't just sit down in a day and be done. I mean, some people can, but most people, even, even most of the best people cannot, right? 300 lines of code, even this code base, like this would take me a couple of days. Like seriously, like seriously. Um, how do you stay motivated? Auditing is, like I said at the beginning, repetition is the mother of skill. S security reviews, repetition is the mother of skill. The first time you do it, 
you're going to suck. You're going to be demotivated. You're going to be like, I'm not going to find anything. Eventually, and I kid you not, you will reach a point, which, and this is going to be kind of terrifying, where you will sit down at a code base and it's not going to be, oh, I hope I find a bug. It's going to be, I'm going to find bugs. How many will I find? It's not going to be, if I find bugs, it's going to be, how many am I going to find? Which is kind of terrifying, but that is the mentality you eventually have. But you have to piecemeal there, right? You're not going to get there right away. You're not going to get there immediately. Um, doing it more and more will get you better. But start small. You know, don't bite off more than you can chew. Start, start small. So this is actually why we launched First Flights, because these are much, much smaller code bases than a production code base. To give you that confidence, it's almost like going to the gym, right? Uh, so for people who are looking to gain that confidence, definitely be sure to try out the Code Hawks First Flights because it's going to the gym. It's giving you that confidence to get a little bit better, a little bit better. And pace yourself, right? When you sit down in the code base and it gets super overwhelming, just take a deep breath and just say, okay, I'm going to try to understand what this code base does. And just piece by piece, piece by piece, set a timer and then take a break after, uh, take a 15 minute break after an hour. Then come back to another, you know, pace yourself. Figure out a pace that works for you. Don't try to run a marathon your first day, right? If you're an athlete, you're not going to run a marathon your first day. The first day, you're probably going to run maybe half a mile. And then you do a mile. And then maybe a mile and a half. And then two miles. And you build up to it. So that's how you can do it. Great question. Can I do this using hard hat? Yes, you absolutely can. A lot of products will be written in hard hat. Did learn a lot. Okay, great. Glad to hear that you learned a lot. The security course is free or it's paid. <laughs> Come on, you think I make paid courses? It's free. How much do you charge uh, for an audit or a competitive for a security review? It depends. Depends on the size of the code base. Um, depends on the size of the code base. Depends on if you're doing a private audit. Depends on if you're doing a competitive audit. The answer is it depends. Are you adding any ZK concepts to your audit course? I had a hard time auditing a ZK protocol. Uh, so there's not going to be any ZK stuff in this, but there will be signature stuff, which is kind of the, the key bit to ZK anyways. Auditing requires you to take care of the intricacies of the process. I don't think I could ever audit a contract unless it was my own. Uh, you'd be surprised. You just It's a skill you develop. I tried to run a marathon day one, absolutely tripped and face planted. Thank you for the advice. And that's okay. We all make mistakes and that's fine. So, well, thank you all so much for having me. Good luck, have fun building phenomenal code, and I hope to see you all at Cypher and Updraft.